Hey everyone, welcome back to Secret Plus and our final episode on the weather. I'm your host, Julian. If you missed our first two episodes, we touched on what makes forecasting the weather so dang hard and whether it's possible to control the weather. There are a lot of things to unpack in those topics, so be sure to check them out if you haven't. But today we're going to talk about modifying the weather on steroids. Yeah, let's talk about terraforming, which just means earth forming. Chances are by now you've probably heard that word thrown around too, whether in movies, books, or on the news. But what does terraforming actually entail? If this were to happen in the future, where are some likely places this could go down? And of course, something we're all thinking, what are the odds of something like this succeeding? So let's start off with something near and dear to my heart, video games. If you're like me, you've played your fair share of games and in some of them you can build and construct without limitations. You can make whole cities, you can alter environmental conditions, you can even do these things on other worlds. And that's basically the idea of terraforming. The line of thinking goes that an environment isn't suitable for humanity, whether because it's too hot or too cold, or maybe it just doesn't have an atmosphere that we can breathe. So the planet is modified to accommodate all of these pressing needs, which is just so self-centered. I mean, I don't see why, you know, we can't just change ourselves, maybe with some genetic engineering. That way we could finally kick this oxygen habit, but we're just so high maintenance. We'd rather change the whole world than change ourselves. Really something to think about. Anyway, those are the basic rules of terraforming. And usually when it crops up in sci-fi, the process takes anywhere from a few decades to maybe a century. Usually it's just a footnote that's kind of glossed over so our space heroes can get on with the business of doing space heroics. In reality, terraforming would be so much more difficult than most fictional adventures portray it to be. One of the first scientists to propose a terraforming project was actually Carl Sagan. Yeah, the Carl Sagan. He published an article in 1961 that involved altering Venus to make it more Earth-like. Before diving into his proposal, if it sounds strange to imagine that such a famous scientist would propose an outlandish idea that's steeped more in science fiction than science fact, here's a little more context for you. Scientists had just figured out how to modify the weather about 15 years earlier with cloud seeding experiments, which is all about modifying clouds to increase precipitation. So it wasn't far-fetched to believe that this concept could be taken even further to a global scale and alter a climate. By the 60s, we were also finally learning more about the conditions on Venus, especially its thick clouds that upended decades of previous thought about the planet. So in his article, Carl Sagan suggested infusing Venus's carbon dioxide dominated atmosphere with algae that would convert the CO2 into organic compounds and reduce the runaway greenhouse effect, hopefully cooling the planet. Now, obviously this proposal never came to fruition and later on Sagan himself even thought the idea was flawed. Again, terraforming is much easier said than done. You may have seen our last series all about Venus and some of you may be wondering if we could terraform such a hellish planet. And I think that's a good place to start. There are three major obstacles or conditions that would need to change if we wanted to seriously terraform Venus. First, Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system, so we'd need to find a way to cool the planet down. One of the more common ideas thrown around here involves constructing a large, massive shade or multiple smaller shades around L1, the first Lagrange point between Venus and the Sun. Obviously, this shade would cool down the planet, but it would also block both solar wind and solar radiation from reaching it. Venus's temperature would quickly fall from the point where it currently melts lead to something a little more agreeable. The carbon dioxide that makes up about 96% of the atmosphere would turn to liquid, and as the pressure drops, this liquid would start to freeze and fall to the surface as dry ice. This affects the second major roadblock to terraforming the planet, Venus's atmosphere. Like I mentioned, the atmosphere is toxic from carbon dioxide. One estimate suggested that about 500 quintillion kilograms of excess CO2 would need to be removed from the atmosphere. The atmosphere is not only deadly and contributing to a runaway greenhouse effect, it's also about 90 times more pressurized than Earth. It's kind of like Master Hand from Super Smash Bros. It's just gonna crush you and not think twice about it. 
But when the temperature drops and the CO2 turns into frozen mountains on the surface, the pressure would also fall. We could then launch the frozen CO2 into space, turning it into a moon orbiting the planet, and then maybe use it as storage for future things down the road. Maybe we'd keep our popsicles there. I don't know. It all seems kind of ridiculous when you're talking about a dry ice moon. But if the massive shades around the planet don't work out, well, maybe there's another proposal that would work, like chemical reactions, which actually makes Carl Sagan's idea sound more reasonable than he might have thought. A more recent idea includes seeding the atmosphere with hydrogen and triggering a chemical reaction with the CO2 to create graphite and water. The water would rain down onto the planet's surface and form oceans, covering most of it, while the graphite could be sequestered. Again, somehow, I don't know. The third obstacle involves Venus's rotation. It is very, 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 very slow, rotating about once every 243 Earth days. We're just not made for those long extended periods of sun and darkness. Ask anyone who's spent a winter in Alaska or Scandinavia. So to fix that, one idea involves bombarding the planet with asteroids to speed up its spin. However, we would need more asteroids than in the entire solar system to accomplish that. And we'd probably destroy the planet's surface while we were at it, and that's generally considered a no-no. So the next idea would be to ignore changing the rotation entirely by going back to something like those shades I mentioned earlier. Basically, we would need to construct another set of mirrors around the poles to reflect light onto Venus and create a 24-hour day-night cycle, similar to what we're already used to. I think you're starting to grasp the monumental absurdity of all of this. It would take an unfathomable amount of time and work, and the most likely scenario would include a combination of tactics. To begin with, we're years and years away from having the technology that would even let us construct something like giant shades or mirrors in space anyway. And then think about the logistics. <sighs> None of the ideas explain how we'd successfully get a breathable atmosphere either, which, you know, as many of you might know, it's kind of key to making a place Earth-like. So terraforming Venus in any respect is not going to happen in our lifetimes, or our children's lifetimes, or even our great 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 grandkids' lifetimes. I think you get the idea. Maybe that's why some people want to focus instead on terraforming Mars. The conditions there aren't as harsh, but still, it's no picnic. Not to get your hopes up from the get-go, but Mars does run into similar challenges like we see on Venus with temperature and atmosphere. However, instead of thinning the atmosphere and cooling the planet like Venus, for Mars, we would need to do the opposite. So to make Mars a habitable world, we'd need a thicker atmosphere a warmer planet, and of course, we've got to make the atmosphere breathable, right? A handful of proposals out there actually do manage to address a couple of these issues at the same time by setting off a greenhouse effect on the planet. These ideas often call for introducing compounds like ammonia, methane, fluorine, or chlorofluorocarbons into the atmosphere, warming up the place. Now, I figure we could just kill two birds with one stone and basically, you know, do that Patrick Star meme where we just take the CO2 from Venus and put it on Mars using magic or something. I haven't really sketched out all the details. Even if we thickened Mars's atmosphere, though, there would still be the challenge of keeping it there. Mars's current atmosphere is so wispy because it is constantly stripped away by solar wind. So to counter this, there's a proposal to create a magnetic field at the Sun-Mars L1 Lagrange point. You know, just a human-made magnetic field big enough to surround a planet. You know, that ought to do it, right? Easy. At this point in the hypothetical scenario, we've got a thicker atmosphere and a magnetic field, but that atmosphere still isn't breathable. It would be full of greenhouse gases, so one idea suggests flooding the world with cyanobacteria to convert carbon dioxide into oxygen through photosynthesis. Cyanobacteria have the distinction of making Earth a breathable world billions of years ago, so maybe we could trigger a similar effect on Mars and make it oxygenated. But who knows if that would actually work, right? If you're like me, I'm sure you've had plenty of times where your meticulous plans went awry. Imagine trying to terraform a whole world. I'm almost positive that things aren't gonna go exactly as planned because that's just often not how life works. All of these ideas 
are massively complicated. I've oversimplified them on purpose to make a point. To get each proposal done in real life requires mind-boggling amounts of funding, technology that we don't have today, and possibly thousands of years to even make a dent. Which is maybe why it seems like I'm glossing over details here. So let's take a step back for a minute. These ideas I mentioned so far are early conceptualizations about remaking a world in the image of Earth. Having a clear plan with fine details worked out isn't in the cards yet, and probably won't be for a long time to come. Maybe the real question that we should be asking, though, is why? Why do we want to terraform another world? Well, probably one of the most glaring reasons is that we might need a place to go in case of a global catastrophe, like an asteroid impact, or nuclear war, or effects from a warming climate. Trust me, if Earth looks like it's gonna die, we're gonna try pretty darn hard to find a new home, whether that's Venus, Mars, or someplace else. But what if there's not a catastrophe we can point to? What if there just aren't enough resources? That's another reason people use in conversations about terraforming, that will simply run out of resources because of a growing population. Right now, in 2022, there's a little under 8 billion people worldwide. Most estimates suggest Earth's carrying capacity is between 8 and 16 billion people, so we're right at the cusp of that range. Now, I am not trying to sound the alarm bells here because fear-mongering about limited resources is nothing new, and it's often led to tragic consequences. Currently, there are tons of projects aimed at increasing food, water, and energy production, and lots of them look promising. That's been the trend for centuries, and there have been plenty of past innovations that have made sustaining larger and larger populations possible. Nonetheless, running out of resources is a concern that will continue to be talked about for years, among other reasons for leaving our home world. So it's likely that terraforming in some capacity is going to be discussed too. But will anyone actually see the fruits of their labor? Honestly, if I was a betting man, I'd say the likelihood of terraforming one of our neighboring planets like Venus or Mars is about as small as me being named Supreme Ruler of Earth. I mean, go ahead, prove me wrong, I like the sound of that, but I just don't think it's gonna happen. The idea of terraforming makes great sci-fi fodder, but it is an incredibly impractical undertaking. It looks like Earth is going to remain the only planet that's truly welcoming to us. You know so long as we don't trash the place too badly. All right, that's it for this episode of Seeker Plus. Thanks so much for joining. I touched base on a few different things here, but I'm curious to know what you think. Would you live on a terraformed Venus or Mars? Or even in like a glass dome because we couldn't terraform the whole planet? Or would you prefer to stay here on Earth even with the risk of, you know, mega hurricanes and nuclear war and that sort of thing? Let us know. You can find us on Twitter at Seeker. I'm also on there at Hug It Out. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on Seeker Plus.